The focus on legendary figures of the Wild West usually center on the villains of the era. Banditos, outlaws, criminals, desperados, all coming from various walks of life. It makes sense, too. The Old West is often regarded for its lawlessness, brash behavior, and uncontrolled violence plaguing smaller settlements and open territories. Much of that legacy was left behind by the antagonists of the Western frontier. However, there's also a reason the West was eventually tamed for good. For as many outlaws and bandits that rode through the plains, deserts, and mountainsides of the frontier, there were countless deputies, sheriffs, and marshals waiting to catch them in their shadows. After all, the Old West is one of the biggest vacuums of folktales and storytelling in any period in American history or otherwise. And nothing completes a story like the good guys versus the bad guys, your point of view on who is who notwithstanding. To gather a better glimpse into the lives and legacies of some of the finest heroes against the seemingly undying waves of criminal activity, here is the first in a series of videos detailing brilliant United States lawmen and larger-than-life figures of the Wild West. Introducing The Legend of Bass Reeves. Bass Reeves, a future lawman and the first black U.S. Marshal west of the Mississippi River, was born in July of 1838 to enslaved parents in Crawford County, Arkansas. He was named after his grandfather, Bass Washington, and took on the surname of his owner, Arkansas State Legislator William Steele Reeves, as was the unfortunate yet common practice amongst enslaved peoples both before and during the 19th century. Bass Reeves spent much of his childhood as a water boy on his Crawford County farm, until he was old enough to work in the crops as a field hand. When he was only eight years old, sometime in 1846, William Reeves uprooted his entire plantation and moved to Grayson County, Texas, where Bass Reeves and his family were still enslaved. In Grayson County, Bass Reeves befriended William's son and future Speaker of the Texas House of Representatives, George Reeves. George and Bass spent many a day together, with George sometimes offering protection and writing services to Bass during their downtime. When the two boys were of age, George was thrust right into the Civil War, fighting on the side of the Confederacy, as Texas had declared support for the rebellion. George dragged Bass along with him, despite Bass's lack of approval. Bass's service time included rumored participation in the Battle of Pea Ridge in March of 1862, the Battle of Chickamauga in September of 1863, and the Battle of the Missionary Ridge in November of 1863. All battles were served under the command of his old companion and current superior, Colonel George Reeves. However, it was also during the Civil War that Bass eventually escaped from his bondage, thought to occur prior to the latter two conflicts. While many accounts differ in the exact nature of Bass's departure, the most agreed upon story centers on a game of cards between Reeves and his former owner, George. Legend has it that during one of the quieter moments of George and Bass's tenure in the Confederate Army, the two men were playing cards when Bass ended one round with a victory much to the chagrin of George. The two men then entered a physical altercation that saw Bass beat George to a pulp. Knowing he wasn't long for survival with the assault on a white soldier, Bass fled the South as he knew it and escaped to the Indian Territory located in predominantly present-day Oklahoma. A few accounts believe Bass left the Confederate Army as he had grown inspired by the whispers of freeing the slaves by the federal government. Nonetheless, Bass didn't take his chances remaining enslaved and sought sanctuary with various bands of Native Americans, most notably the Seminole, Cherokee, and Creek tribes located in the territory. With the tribes, Bass quickly learned their culture and ways of life. He was taught various languages and dialects at each camp he stayed in, gaining impressive education regarding indigenous customs and more importantly, tracking skills used to hunt game and wanted outlaws. The Seminole, Cherokee, and Creek also taught Bass vital firearm skills. Bass was a natural gunman and became well known around the territorial campsites for his pistol accuracy. Legend has it he was also barred from shooting competitions held by the tribes, 
even though his rifle skills apparently sat somewhere around average. Of course, the turkey and other wild game used in the skills competitions would happily disagree. Bass's tenure in Indian territory would only last a short time, however, when the Emancipation Proclamation and later the 13th Amendment of the United States Constitution abolished all slavery and made Bass Reeves a freed man once and for all. Embracing his newfound title as a freedman, Bass left his tribal brothers and sisters for a new life near Van Buren, Arkansas. Here, Bass took up ranching and started a family after he married a Texas woman by the name of Nellie Jenny in 1864. Over the next few years, Bass and Nellie Reeves would see their family grow, eventually having 10 children together, five girls and five boys. Everyone helped out around the farm, and after a bit of time, Bass was able to focus his efforts in other areas around rural Arkansas. One such opportunity came from the Van Buren Federal Court, a local judiciary with partial jurisdiction over Indian Territory. The court was seeking out folks to act as guides for the U.S. Deputy Marshals going through Indian Territory and criminal roundups. With his insight into the surrounding lands and communication skills with various indigenous dialects, Bass was seen as a perfect fit and would accompany larger posses on occasion. Indian Territory was rife with outlaws and thieves finding refuge, due to the lack of major federal or state jurisdiction in the region. In 1875, Bass's infrequent quests into Indian Territory would become a full-time career after the Federal Western District Court relocated to Fort Smith, Arkansas, and Isaac C. Parker was appointed federal judge on May 10th. Immediately after his appointment, Parker chose James F. Fagan as the U.S. Marshal, and followed up with a request for additional hires for around 200 open Deputy U.S. Marshal positions. Bass Reeves was one of Fagan's first thoughts when finding a lawman who would suffice as Deputy Marshal. Fagan remembered Reeves' past relationships with a few tribes and ability to speak multiple languages. It was quite apparently a match made in heaven. After a short recruitment on the behalf of Parker and Fagan, Bass Reeves was made the first black marshal west of the Mississippi. He was assigned to the Western District where he had been serving as a local scout, now in charge of his own crew of lawmen. Operating on dead or alive orders from Judge Parker, Reeves started manhunts across the 75,000 square miles he had been directed to cover. To collect his assignments, Reeves would first visit the United States Courthouse at Fort Smith where he'd receive warrants for wanted criminals. Reeves was unable to read or write, but hired someone to read aloud all of the warrants down to their gritty details. Reeves would then memorize each warrant for all of its information, so when it came time to arrest, he could pick out the corresponding warrant without fail. Despite his illiteracy, his deft memory and intuition led to over 3,000 felony arrests and various rewards for his detective work. After Reeves would select his desired warrants, he'd make way into the untamed wilderness on his legendary white stallion, accompanied with a wagon, a cook, and usually a Native American posseman. These quests would traverse places like Fort Reno or the unassigned lands of Oklahoma Territory, reaching a round trip upwards of almost 1,000 miles. Sometimes, Reeves' bounty missions would see him team up with other famous lawmen, such as Bud Ledbetter and Bill Tillman. These pairings helped Reeves establish a respected status among U.S. Marshals, celebrated for his courage in the face of the grittiest of outlaws, and his unparalleled skills as an ambidextrous gunman, sporting two Colt pistols he could draw in the blink of an eye. When working by his lonesome, Reeves became well known as a master of disguise, being one of the first to utilize multiple aliases and various appearances, whether it be a tired cowboy rugged gunslinger, or a seething outlaw. One of Reeves' most iconic disguises came on the Texas border while chasing down a pair of outlaws in the Red River Valley. After pursuing the bandits across the state of Texas, Reeves and his posse made up camp 30 miles away from the outlaw's hideout. They had taken shelter in the house of one of the outlaw's mothers, and Reeves knew just the trick to draw them out into the open. Directing his men to stand pat at the wayward campsite, 
Reeves set out to investigate the Red River Valley terrain, learning of its details and the stragglers who crossed the rural vista. He then rummaged through his clothes and found the dirtiest, most tattered garments, disguising himself as a tramp looking for refuge. Reeves then hid his handcuffs, guns, and U.S. Marshal badge in the pockets and seams of his clothing, so as not to draw the suspicion of the folks at home. After a 28-mile walk in old, beat-up shoes, Reeves made it to the old woman's house, making sure to show off his wooden cane and to tip his bullet-hole-ridden cap when she greeted him. When the mother asked of Reeves' intentions, he told her that he had been chased by a posse of bounty hunters, explaining the holes in his hat were his trophies of a successful escape. He kindly asked for a warm meal, and he was always so courteous and respectful, even during undercover missions. The outlaw's mother was moved by Reeves' performance and invited him in for supper. It was over the dinner table that she started spilling the beans of her son's own escapades as an outlaw. She went as far as to suggest Reeves might think about joining forces with them, an idea Reeves showed interest in from the get-go. The woman, comfortable enough to allow Reeves to stay into the evening, perked up when a loud whistle echoed from the valley behind the house, just as the sun was setting. She walked to the back door and let out a distinguished whistle herself, a sign that the coast was clear. Minutes later, the two outlaws walked inside and were quickly made familiar with Reeves. They didn't keep their guard up either, as the one outlaw's mother went on about Reeves' own troubles with the law. The pair of bandits agreed the best course of action was to come together as a trio and decided to set off in the morning for their next major sting. That night, Reeves slept in the same room as the outlaws, studying them carefully as to not draw attention to himself. When they both hit a deep sleep, he stood quietly and tiptoed over to their bunks, where he attached handcuffs to their wrists, never waking them from their slumber. The following morning, Reeves stood tall with his pistols at the ready, badge in one hand, and woke up the groggy outlaws. It was only seconds before they realized they were done for and Reeves barked at them to stand and march outside, much to the dismay of the mother. The irate woman then followed Reeves and his catch for nearly three miles, berating him for abusing her trust and taking away her boy. In the end, it didn't matter, as Reeves eventually got the bandits back to the Red River campsite and would collect his $5,000 bounty from the courts in a few days' time. Around the same time, Reeves got a stake to claim in his takedown of the infamous bandit named Bob Dozier, who was known for committing just about every crime known possible within Indian territory. Dozier was also known for being fleet on foot and completely unpredictable. It's why no bounty hunter or lawman alike could bring him in before Bass Reeves picked up his warrant without a second thought. Reeves utilized his tracking skills he had learned during his time with the Native Americans and followed him all the way into Cherokee Nation, Dozier knew Reeves was on his trail and sent threatening letters and other messengers to attempt to thwart his pursuit, but Reeves persisted, unbothered by Dozier's games. On December 20th, 1878, Reeves ascended the Cherokee Hills with his trustiest posseman. They were in desperate need of dry ground as a thunderous storm was approaching the woodland, but before a fire could be built, Reeves was nearly killed with a bullet that buzzed by his ear. Knowing danger was imminent, Reeves leapt for cover, spotting a shadow skimming through the nearby trees. He shot two rounds at the shadow before multiple shots rang out back towards the deputy marshal. Reeves, laying on the ground, peered around the trees to see Dozier bumbling towards him, caught in a fit of laughter, believing he had once again tricked another lawman into certain death. Of course, this was no ordinary lawman. Reeves stood up squarely and demanded Dozier surrender his gun, but Dozier heeded no compliance. In seconds, the outlaw raised his rifle from a crouched position, only for Reeves to beat him to the draw and fire a single, mortal round to the neck. Blood was spilt, but Reeves had remained victorious once again. Reeves' time as a deputy marshal wasn't all success stories, however. In 1887, he was charged with murdering his posse cook, allegedly due to a weapons malfunction while Reeves was cleaning his rifle. Reeves was forced to stand trial, but was fortunate enough to be represented by a close colleague in W.H.H. Clayton and tried before his longtime friend, 
Judge Isaac Parker. Due to his pristine record and familiarity with the courts, Reeves was acquitted on all charges and never brushed with the wrong side of the law again. Rather, the misstep fueled Reeves further into his career. The late 1880s and early 1890s saw plenty of additional accomplishments. These ranged from the disbandment of the Tom Story Gang after the titular leader's death in Paris, Texas in 1889, to the arrest of the notorious Seminole bandit, Greenleaf, after 18 years of avoiding capture in 1890. In 1896, Reeves' fortunes once again took a turn for the worse when his wife, Nellie, died of cancer at Fort Smith. Three years prior, Reeves had been transferred to the Eastern District of Texas and would again be moved after his wife's death, this time to Muskogee Federal Court of Indian Territory in 1897. Reeves would marry once again in 1900, this time to Winnie Sumter of Oklahoma Territory. However, he found himself right back in the thick of a family matter a couple of years later in 1902. Reeves had just returned to Muskogee with two wanted criminals to the U.S. Marshal at the time, Leo Bennett. While finishing his reports with Bennett, the U.S. Marshal informed Reeves that his son, Benny Reeves, was charged and wanted for the murder of his wife after the couple had a quarrel over Benny's increasing jealousy. Reeves was shocked at the news and did not take to it very well. None of the other deputy marshals had wanted the warrant despite it sitting on Bennett's desk for 48 hours prior. They all knew the risks of going after one of their own and left it up to Reeves to decide. After a few days of tireless debate with himself, Reeves felt it was his responsibility to hunt down his own son and ask him to pay for his crimes. A two-week period passed by, and Reeves finally returned with his son, alive, but in handcuffs. He was found guilty on murder charges and sentenced to life in prison, shipped off to serve his time at Fort Leavenworth Penitentiary in Kansas. In the end, Reeves' impassioned pleas to be the one to arrest his son paid dividends, as Benny Reeves was seen as an exemplary prisoner who never caused one iota of an issue 11 years into his sentence. After a citizen's petition, the boy-turned-man was fully pardoned and went on to live a normal, positive life after being given a second chance. A few years prior, Bass Reeves saw his own life change before his eyes. In 1907, after the admittance of Oklahoma to the Union as an official state, he was transitioned from deputy marshal to officer for the Muskogee Police Department. Even his short stint as a patrolman went swimmingly. Reeves beat on his entire two-year tenure without a single reported crime, and he left the department with a clean track record and a respected president left behind. By 1909, Bass Reeves was barely a shell of his former self, having retired from the law and succumbed to his sickbed. Reeves was eventually diagnosed with Bright's disease, more officially known as nephritis. In short, Reeves' kidneys had inflamed past the point of healing, and it was only a matter of time before the illness took his life. Bass Reeves drew his final breath on January 12, 1910. After a small ceremony with friends and peers, he was buried in Muskogee, Oklahoma at the Agency Cemetery. As of today, the grave remains unmarked and is currently located on public property making visitations to the Old West legend hard to come by. Nevertheless, Bass Reeves' story lives on through books, films, and oral traditions. In the years since his time guarding the Western territories from scum and villainy, he has become an underrated figure in the Wild West's history. His accomplishments have gone as far as to suggest he is one of the main inspirations for the massive hit radio serial and television series, The Lone Ranger, amongst other properties. While there is still plenty of debate around the exact impact Bass Reeves has left on the lore of America's frontier, without a doubt, his efforts cannot be denied. He was most famously quoted as saying, maybe the law ain't perfect, but it's the only one we got, and without it, we got nothing. And it's true. Without the dedication of folks like Bass Reeves, we'd still be left in the belligerent mess of violence that once plagued the Western territories. Instead, we are left with one of the finest tales of heroism and justice in both black history and American history. It's up to us to continue to share his exploits 
and make sure his goodwill does not go unseen. This is the legend of Bass Reeves.